Hello. In this video, I'm going to talk more about radical halogenation. In particular, I'm going to start with the thermodynamics of this reaction. Uh, and then as the series goes on, we're going to talk about other uh, issues related to the selectivity uh, of the reaction and the outcomes with different halogens. I'm going to end up focusing a lot on chlorine and bromine. So here's my generic reaction, methane plus X2, a generic halogen molecule, UV irradiation to get the radical reaction, chloromethane or, or halomethane and, and hydrogen halide as the products. Uh, and again, I'm going to focus usually on chlorine and bromine. And this first video in the series is going to be spent answering the question, why not fluorine or iodide? And if you've already studied the addition reactions of alkenes, you may already have a sense of why not iodine that, um, you know, reactions that might work for chlorine and bromine tend to sometimes not work for iodine because they become endothermic. Uh, and so let's talk about that. Uh, here are some relevant bond association energies for this particular reaction uh, for each of the four halogens. And so the carbon-hydrogen bond in methane is going to be the same in all four cases, but the halogen-halogen bond, the carbon-halogen bond, and the hydrogen-halogen bond vary in strength in kilojoules per mole based on the uh, different halogens. And if we were to take these bond association energies and use them to estimate the enthalpy change of reactions, we'd get these values that I have listed over here on the far right. Um, and we do that by... Uh, adding the bond association energies of the reactants and subtracting the bond association energies of the products, right? So it takes energy input to break the bonds and the reactants, and then we get energy back out when we form the products. And so for fluorine, we get negative 431 kilojoules per mole, so very exothermic. Chlorine, negative 104 kilojoules per mole, still exothermic. Bromine, negative 33 kilojoules per mole, only slightly exothermic, and then iodine, plus 55 kilojoules per mole. So now we're endothermic. And so the real, one of the big reasons why we don't use fluorine is that it's, the reaction is very exothermic and it's hard to control. Uh, it's generating so much energy. And this energy, as you see, is uh, much more energy is being generated than is required to break the fluorine-fluorine bond. And so this re reaction can kind of take off out of control if you're not careful. Now, there are places out there uh, that do this reaction on industrial scale because there's some commercially important uh, halo al or, uh, commercially important fluoroalkanes, um, but I'd never want to do this in the lab. You know, fluorine F2 is a gas. It's uh, among the most violently reactive of all substances, and, and so it's very dangerous. Chlorine and bromine are both exothermic, but the degree to which they're exothermic is much smaller, and the amount of energy that's released in the reaction isn't uh, quite enough initially to set off the next reaction to, or to invest in breaking the halogen-halogen bond. And then in the case of iodine, uh, the, you know, the reaction with iodine is endothermic, so it's in, in so... Uh, assuming that the entho, ent I'm sorry, assuming that the entropy change is small or insignificant, uh, this reaction is going to be non-spontaneous. Not to say that you can't make this happen with some serious energy input. It's just it's non-spontaneous on its own. I want to just talk about one more example. Uh, this time, looking at the individual steps of the radical halogenation and also starting from a different uh, reaction. So this is uh, the radical halogenation of ethene, uh, and I've shown both propagation steps here. And for chlorine, or for fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, I have calculated the uh, enthalpy, or the approximate enthalpy change for step one and for step two. And so you can kind of see where the breakdown is. So the uh, enthalpy, or so the enthalpy change for for step one, uh, for brom or for fluorine and chlorine is negative, uh, and it's positive for bromine and iodine. And then for step two, it's it's negative. So it's exo step two is exothermic for all four halogens. It's just you can see as you go from fluorine, chlorine to bromine to iodine, it gets less and less negative. 
to the point where, again, for iodine, the overall reaction is endothermic. Uh, with fluorine, again, the overall reaction is exothermic, and if you can, you can see that the amount of energy released in step one uh, is way or is, is negative, and in step two is negative, and overall, it's just a lot of energy released. And then for iodine, step one requires so much energy put in that it is really hard to proceed. Uh, bromine, the first step, is endothermic, but the whole reaction is exothermic to a larger number. So as the reaction proceeds, it's generating some energy that can be used to invest in accomplishing step one for subsequent reactions. And then here is a, a box to just highlight again that chlorine and bromine are sort of the most productive here, that chlorine is exothermic, bromine is exothermic, but they're not so exothermic, they're uncontrollable, and they're not endothermic, which means they're not spontaneous. In the next video, uh, we'll look at the chlorination of a molecule that, that's got different kinds of, of positions on it, and talk about the different products that might form. And then we'll uh, look at selectivity uh, and help understand which one of those products might be the major product. Uh, and then we will talk about uses of, of radical halogenation and synthesis, and then a special way to do allylic radical halogenation. Thank you for watching.